welcome to Climate Fest. I'm Judy Abdo, and I am introducing Richard Bloom, and I'm going to do it very briefly. They gave me a whole thing to read, but I'm not going to do all of that. But first, let me say, Richard Bloom was on the Santa Monica City Council. He served as mayor three times, is that right? And um, was, was on the city council for, tells me here, 13 years. So, and did a wonderful job here. And then he was elected to the uh, assembly in 2012. So you can do the math, in 2012 is when he started. We're in 2018 now. And of course there's an election happening right now, but he's unopposed. So, um, he was appointed to the chair of the Assembly Budget Subcommittee on Resources and Transportation, where he established himself as a leader on, guess what, climate change. So, that's why we wanted him here. And he's going to tell us whatever it is that we need to know that's going on in Sacramento at the assembly level. So, I'm just going to stop talking and bring up Richard Bloom. Thank you, Judy. Good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. I always enjoy speaking in Santa Monica, and uh, I want to express some appreciation to Judy because I know um, she did a lot of the organizing for today, but for all the folks who were involved in organizing this Climate Fest, I'm not sure Climate Fest sounds right to me. You know, we should be like having a festival around climate, climate change. Uh, but it's not time to throw in the towel either. There's a lot going on, as you all know, because I think you're all engaged on the issue of climate change. There's a lot going on, and we have a lot of work to do. We all know that. And just, I, I guess the number one message that I bring to you here today is that in Sacramento, we're deeply engaged on the issue. And just weeks after I was elected to the State Assembly back in 2012, as Judy mentioned, I was appointed as chair of that budget subcommittee on resources and transportation. And that is the committee that oversees virtually everything that the state does on climate change. And uh, whether it's transportation or cap and trade, we're overseeing that budget in my subcommittee. It's been a lot of work, but it's been very gratifying and enjoyable work. But even before my legislative assignment in the State Assembly, addressing climate change was, um, again, as Judy mentioned, something that was an area of interest, not just of mine, but uh, uh, for our entire city council here in, in Santa Monica. And like many of you, I was trying to learn as much as I could to um, so that I could do my fair share and uh, help convince and teach other folks about, uh, uh, about this issue. But the breadth of the issue goes beyond just Santa Monica, obviously, and beyond our region. It involves everyone around us and it involves the entire world, so this is a major undertaking. But here in Santa Monica, we always push policies that would reduce our city's carbon footprint whether that was investing in better public transportation, the big blue bus is a good example of a transportation system that moved early on to alternative fuels and is now making the leap to electric buses. That's gonna take some time, but it's an important transition, electrifying as much of our transportation system as is possible is critically important to addressing climate change because about 40% of the uh, emissions that we see out there are due to transportation. So cleaner vehicles, also greener building standards, 40% of our emissions come from buildings. And so making sure that our buildings are energy efficient, that are using solar power um, and, and the like, greener building standards are critically important to addressing climate change also improved energy efficiency, 
and uh, uh, renewables are obviously part of the solution. For many of us addressing climate change, this is something that has been ingrained now as a way of life, a way of thinking, and are uh, in, ingrained in the everyday actions that we're taking in our communities. And as Californians, we've long known that uh, uh, we needed to provide leadership on this issue, but it's never been more critical than it is today. But it was about a decade ago, a little over a decade ago, behind the leadership of our former assembly member and senator from right here in this area, Fran Pavley. Fran Pavley was responsible, not alone, because no bill passes by itself, but she was responsible and the author of AB 32 that created the first greenhouse gas emission reduction goals in the country and really the first significant action to reduce greenhouse gases in the world. And I remember being at a conference a number of years ago um, that was around the issue of climate change and energy efficiency in particular and Fran was in the room and people were talking about the Pavley bill and the Pavley this and the Pavley that and Fran finally raised her hand and said I'm Pavley but these were people who didn't know her but they knew her work and therefore they knew California's stature and work on these very important goals. California followed that in 2007 with the low carbon fuel standard which set goals to reduce petroleum consumption and now we're resetting those here in California and setting 2050 goals. But those actions too set in motion changes on a national, national and even an international scale. With AB 32, we then created our cap and trade system, which has been our primary tool that has put us on the path to reaching our initial goals of 1990 greenhouse gas emission levels by 2020. And now we've doubled down because California has been successful in that initial effort. In 2016, we passed SB 32, which set a goal of 40% below the, the 1990 greenhouse gas emission levels. We want to get there by 2030. It's an ambitious goal, but it's doable if the Trump administration lets us get there. And of course, I think you know, I'm not going to dwell a lot on uh, uh, the administration's actions to try and stop California from achieving its goals, but I think you know that we will be fighting those as we are currently, tooth and nail, to make sure that we preserve our independence and our ability to provide the leadership that's necessary and that's absent at the federal government now. But that isn't all. We thank you. Uh, that isn't all. We've invested billions of dollars in electric and hydrogen fuel cell research and development and grants and market incentives for consumers purchasing vehicles or local governments that are purchasing sustainable bus fleets. We're beginning a transformation in the agricultural industry by replacing old, dirty diesel equipment with the cleanest technology available today, while at the same time implementing the latest technologies to reduce methane from our dairies. And in our forests, we're beginning to develop incentives that protect trees and allow landowners to get paid for that as trees are some of our most important carbon sinks. And the need for healthy forests has never been more apparent to us as we learn year after year for the past few years um, how intense the fires are and the release of carbon that happens along with those fires uh, uh, throughout the state. This problem only gets worse with um, uh, the intensifying bark beetle infestation that we have in the state that is already killed or is killing 120 million trees throughout the state. It only gets worse if we don't tend to good forestry practices in our forests throughout the state. And that's why our uh, budget this year will have additional money for addressing some of the needs in our, in our forests. But this is a long-term problem that needs uh, uh, a, a long-term plan to address it and we intend to do just that in, uh, uh, in Sacramento. So California really is a trailblazer on these issues, 
but I frankly myself didn't fully comprehend California's leadership on a global scale until I came to Sacramento. While I was aware that we were doing things here that other countries are not, what I learned when I was first elected in 2012 was that communities and states throughout the country and nations around the world are looking to California and want to partner with us. Now, back in the good old days of the Obama administration, the US EPA adopted a national low carbon fuel standard. The states of Washington and Oregon have joined forces with California to further climate strategies. The Canadian provinces of Ontario and Quebec have joined our cap and trade system. So I think it's fortunate that the world doesn't care about, well, I shouldn't say they don't care. Um, the, the, the world is willing to overlook and look where they need to, to California and to other places in the world to address climate change because we're not seeing that leadership in Washington, D.C. Folks are still watching us and wanting to partner with us in California, which was the overwhelming sentiment when I was at the last International Climate Change Conference in Bonn. But if I can back up for just only one year before that, back in 2016 at the Paris Climate Change Conference, when there was a lot of drama uh, around whether or not the United States was going to be able to join the accord at that time, but it happened because of a change of a few words. Why did we have to change those words? We had to change the words because Congress wasn't going to approve the, climate, the International Climate Change Accord. So instead, uh, we, used, we changed the word uh, must to may, uh, which meant, and, and, and that was a word that uh, uh, described the actions of the International Conference and the, uh, the United States' role in those, when we changed that word to May, it made it possible for the president to sign off the agreement rather than to get congressional approval. So with that drama over, the International Climate uh, Accord was signed, and we celebrated that in 2016. Little did we know that a year later, we would have a president who doesn't believe in science and was telling us that the United States would be withdrawing from the accord. So, it was a year later in Bonn, Germany, at last year's climate change conference, that was just this last fall, uh, that I was able to attend again, and the mood had changed dramatically. The mood of celebration around the great accomplishment of having nearly every country in the world sign this international accord had dissipated, and people were nervous and worried. California stepped into that breach, and I have to tell you, I have never seen so much love for the state of California from around the world. The, the people of the world, are, the world are looking to California, but what they're looking to in California is not just taking place at the state level. It is taking place in communities throughout the, the, uh, the state of California. It's taking place in communities like Santa Monica and like the neighboring communities here in my assembly district and really throughout the state, but at the local level. And we need to keep that up. And we need, frankly, to make sure that you are advocating not just here in your own communities, but also advocating to us in Sacramento because we need to know. I think you know that in Sacramento we care, but we have a lot of issues that we care about, and I want you to always stay focused on us so that we remain focused on climate change. And with our collaborative effort, that's exactly what will happen. California recently became the fifth largest economy in the world. It's inconceivable that the fifth largest economy wouldn't be playing this leadership role on climate change. And so I think that we have all the pieces in place that we need to power California through very, very uncertain times. And I invite you to continue doing the important work that you're doing and staying engaged on this issue 
and thank you, each and every one of you, for that effort. Thank you very much. I have a few minutes to take questions. I do. Yes, sir.
Yes, there has been legislation to that effect. I'm not sure what the status of, of it is. One of the problems um, uh, that's faced is that many of our apartment buildings that were built in the 40s and 50s and even in the 60s um, don't have the infrastructure. There are, are economic issues as well. Um, uh, and so there's lots to be considered in that. But this is an issue that has come up uh, a number of times, and I know that there has been legislation on it. I was told that was the last question, so... Thank you very much to Richard Bloom. Stay I'm sorry. So we're going to transition uh, in this space to the panel, which is the future of mobility, uh, which will be a very exciting discussion. Um, Richard had alluded to some of the issues at hand, and uh, as I'll be making this transition, I'm going to be multitasking as well. So we're going to be hearing today from uh, Francie Steffen, who some of you may know is our mobility manager. She has been particularly involved in establishing what we're calling a new model of mobility. As you may know, there are lots of ways to getting around in Santa Monica and Southern California nowadays, not just in your single, ve in your single occupancy vehicle. And so uh, Santa Monica has to think of how do we get people out of vehicles? How do we get people into more sustainable modes of transportation? How do we get people into options that are essentially zero emissions? Uh, similarly, like electric vehicles, uh, there's also things to consider like autonomous vehicles, shared mobility services, all lots of things that uh, are coming to the cities that we have to address as a policy, infrastructure, and the like. Francis' counterpart is John Rossent. Uh, he is the founder and chief curator of LA CoMotion, which is a global event happening in November, which essentially helps to try to envision the future of urban mobility. So a lot of these technologies people are testing, wanting to see how that will work in practicality. Um, he's also previously led the World Economic Forum, which is famously held in Davos, Switzerland and that of the EG8. So with that, I'd like to welcome both Francie and John to the stage. Hello, thanks for having us here. Um, so, behind me you'll see circulating some general slides about information about Santa Monica. Um, but I want to jump in quickly um, with John and some questions. Um, we'll talk for about 40 minutes or so and then open up for questions. We'll have about 20 minutes for questions, so feel free to start thinking of those. Um, but John, you just moved to Los Angeles. No, I moved to Santa Monica. Ah, very good, very good. So, um, and you started a very important new event. Can you tell us a little bit about why you chose to come to Southern California for that and what the event is all about? Sure. Um, I came from New York City, so no one's perfect, but uh, the foundation that uh, I, I run is called the New Cities Foundation, and we look at the future of cities around the world and how they're evolving. Um, and we look very closely at the impact of technology on cities. We're, very, we're in a very interesting moment in the history of humankind in that uh, a majority, more than a majority of us, for the first time are living in cities. Um, that number is going up. Um, inexorably, we're a very urban planet and now we're entering an extraordinarily urban century for the first time in the history of our species. And so we have to get cities right. And when you look at cities, you really have to look at how you get from point A to point B in a city, the mobility and transportation piece. And I'm, I'm getting to why I'm here. And if you look at that piece, for the past century or even 120 years, if you think about it, nothing has really changed in the mobility landscape of cities. We have internal combustion vehicles, lots and lots of them. We have uh, public, we have buses, and in some cities, subways, uh, taxis, um, and kind of, it hasn't changed for decades. Sorry? Trolley cars, yes, thank you, okay. Well, bicycles, yes, but you know, but it's, what's happening now is we're seeing an extraordinary disruption in that whole space. And it began, you could say, maybe five or six years ago when um, uh, a San Francisco company called Uber burst out of, from nowhere, and everybody started using it. Now we have Lyft, and they're in, I think, uh, 
65 countries now. Um, they employ hundreds and hundreds of thousands of drivers. Um, we have, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Madam, uh, uh, electric vehicles are suddenly appearing everywhere, and thanks to also an Angelino uh, called Elon Musk, who really um, pioneered that revolution. But it's happening at an extraordinary scale. And we have the fact that um, <clears throat> the day after tomorrow, we'll have autonomous vehicles. And I just returned a couple of days ago from a three-day visit to Silicon Valley, looking at some of the um, uh, autonomous vehicle uh, developments up there, and it's really extraordinary. Um, next year, uh, two big corporations, one is GM uh, via uh, a subsidiary called Cruise, and another is Waymo, which is Google, are starting to offer shared autonomous vehicle services in cities. The first. Um, and that will transform our lives. So I think, and we like to think of this as a mobility revolution that we're entering. And every city in the world, big and small, uh, from Santa Monica to Beijing, from Mombasa to Melbourne, is going to be impacted radically. And it's going to be very good for uh, humanity, I think, because uh, it will help clear the air. Uh, if we do it right, and we have to do it right, it will radically ease congestion. Uh, it'll mean that we can get from Santa Monica to downtown quite quickly, efficiently. Um, and uh, so we started at the New Cities Foundation looking at the future of urban mobility with a small conference that we put together around five years ago, and we did it annually. But it, then it became clear to us that Los Angeles and this region was going to emerge more and more as the kind of ground zero of this global mobility revolution. It's obviously, we are the ultimate car city of, of the United States. It's invented car culture. Um, we have enormous problems. We are the most congested city uh, in the world, uh, not only in North America. Yes, absolutely. And uh, for our health and well-being, we have to solve that problem. So, plus you add things like uh, Measure M, which I'm sure some of you are aware of, where voters two and a half years ago voted a sales tax increase, which will raise $121 billion for public transportation infrastructure in, in um, the LA region, Southern California, which is enormous. So, and we think also the fact that we have a 10-year runway now to the Olympics, the 2028 Olympics in Los Angeles, means that we can begin to put in some of that vitally important uh, mobility and transportation infrastructure to create a really new Los Angeles, I think. So it's a very, very exciting. So we brought this conference to Los Angeles last November, and we're going to keep it here on an annual basis. We, it's a little bit like what you see outside. There's a lot of vehicles around. You can test. And we worked with the city. It's in the Arts District of downtown Los Angeles. And we worked with the city to close down streets. We had test tracks. so. You can come and test an electric scooter if you like, of all sorts, or either an electric bike or an autonomous vehicle. And there's also a very uh, interesting discussion, uh, sort of high level discussion with uh, policymakers from around the world, from, from Finland, from France, from China, from Singapore, and obviously from California and, and, and Santa Monica. And uh, uh, we were very glad to have your city manager on stage, uh, he's a terrific guy. So that's what I'm doing here. And because it's become such an important initiative, and because I really, every time I came out here, uh, I fell in love a little bit more with this urban, this amazing urban reality that's, that is greater Los Angeles. My wife and I and our 13-year-old son decided to move out here in uh, about eight months ago. And we couldn't be happier, so. So you've charted a, a view of the future that is incredibly robust and fast and uh, dynamic. Um, what is, if you had a crystal ball um, and you could think about the Los Angeles, uh, the sort of futuristic Los Angeles that's not Blade Runner, that's not you know the dark the dark night uh, yeah. scenarios. Um, what does a positive transportation revisioning of Los Angeles look like in your crystal ball of five to ten to fifteen? years. What will people see and feel and how would it look? Well, yeah, uh, I think that whether it's five or ten or fifteen years is quite important because if you're talking about fifteen years, um, 
I believe that we will have ubiquitous um, shared autonomous vehicles it will be our primary source of, uh, of moving around the city. So essentially they will be <clears throat> app driven. So you can be at home and you say, okay, I want to go to, it's like you order an Uber. I want to go to uh, downtown Los Angeles or Venice and you type in the address. And in a few minutes, some kind of vehicle will roll up in your driveway. Uh, it will almost surely not have a steering wheel, will not have any pedals, and you will get in, and there, there could be other people, because it it's almost surely will be a shared vehicle. It will not be a vehicle that you own. And it will take you in a speedy fashion to, to your address in Venice. Um, if for longer uh, trajectories, um, you could uh, take that vehicle to a metro station and it will be a seamless operation so uh, the payment will be you won't even have to kind of pay at the metro station you have a, an app on your phone and it'll it'll pay for the um, autonomous vehicle to take you to the metro station it will pay for the metro train to wherever you're going Well, the, the whole thing about um, uh, artificial intelligence and big data and things like that, that it allows you to create uh, very, very efficient uh, uh, routes. So it knows in advance that, okay, Barbara, you want to go to Venice, but uh, Jerry wants to go to uh, 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 Marina del Rey. And it knows that, okay, Barbara goes first and it allows both Jerry and Barbara to take that ride very, very efficiently. It's, which is what uh, happens with Uber uh, and, and Lyft. You can, you can take it with other people like Uber Pool. That happens today. What do you think would be, what, what are the drivers that are going to lead towards greater sharing as opposed to people owning their own autonomous vehicle? What are the, the market drivers or the private sector drivers that might push us there? Or is this going to be something that has to be regulated and policy driven? Well, I think I can give you three uh, uh, factors. Uh, one is, I think there's a cultural shift towards sharing. Um, and actually to not owning so many things. I mean, if you look at, um, in my generation, when, I mean, I grew up in New York City, so it's a little bit different, but for many other Americans who didn't grow up in New York City, the first thing they owned was a car. That was their aspiration. That's no longer the case. So I think that um, we're used to sharing, um, uh, whether it's a shared workspace where you go to we work, for example, uh, or whether it's when you go on vacation, you um, get a bedroom via in Barcelona at Airbnb, and it's a shared situation. The millennial generation is used to that. It's a very big cultural shift. So that's one thing. The, the second thing is just the sheer economics. It will be so much cheaper to uh, take a shared autonomous Uber, let's say, um, than to own your own car. And so uh, the average American family um, spends you know, five or six thousand dollars a year on, on a car. That's a lot of money. So if you could save that, and save you know, half of that, that goes right into your pocket. So it will be a kind of economic stimulus, actually, this move to greater sharing, greater autonomy. And then I think the third factor is the regulatory. Um, and it has to do with um, reshaping a lot of zoning regulation, which is starting to happen uh, at the edge. Um, that will continue, I think, because uh, every city uh, uh, mayor or uh, administrator is facing congestion, pollution. These are real economic costs, and it's in everybody's interest to reduce the number of cars on the streets. I think there's, you know, one interesting issue is because we live in America and we take our cars as seriously, unfortunately, as we take our guns, that there's a possible danger that um, this becomes a political, a big political issue in the United States. You know, I want my car, right? and um, no one's going to take it from me. But I think, you know, I, I don't know, I think the economics are going to be so overwhelmingly in favor of shared solutions that 
maybe that will mitigate some of that. One of the um, growing refrains that one hears in the discussion about how to avoid the, the increased VMT, there, there are some that argue that um, the increasing autonomy of vehicles will take away some of the actual costs or the out-of-pocket costs but also the time costs of commuting and therefore drive people to be commuting much longer distances than they currently do. Um, in addition to um, commuting, uh, poten potentially changing the economics of what's happening inside the car. Um, what people are often coming up with these days is the idea of congestion pricing or efficiency metrics on, on roadways. Um, this too has a lot of political foes. Um, New York has been trying to do congestion pricing now for probably over about 10 years. Um, some cities are doing it quite effectively. London, um, different in Sweden, they're doing it. Um, what do you think about the potential in an American context to deliver some sort of uh, pricing that could disincentivize the VMT increases, or sorry, vehicle miles traveled increases and, and emissions increases that could come with autonomy? Well, I like congestion pricing. I mean, I, you know, I think it's a very good solution for some cities. And it's worked fairly well in London and in some other cities, uh, in Italy, for example. I think it's going to be almost impossible in Los Angeles for the near future. Um, again, that goes back to, you know, people do like their cars. And how do you, you know, what areas of the cities do you sort of geofence for charging? I think it's going to be very, very, very difficult. Uh, and until you have and it won't be really another you know, 10 years before you have really great public transportation options. Until you have those, you really can't, you know, you know or, 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 you know, much more uh, shared autonomous vehicles. And see, one of the interesting things that Francie is alluding to is if you take the driver out of the picture with autonomy, you drive the price down a lot. So right now, for example, um, to get to downtown Los Angeles, it's probably fifteen dollars in Uber. If you take the driver out of that and it becomes a shared autonomous vehicle, it could be two dollars. It could be the same that you pay Metro to get that way, but much you know in a nice vehicle, etc. So that's how the relationship between that world and the public transport authorities like Metro is going to be very interesting one to navigate. I mean, my own feeling is that we should make public transport completely free. It should be a free service. But Are there, um, or do you think Los Angeles is ready for a network of bus rapid transit lanes where buses then would, you know, for maybe if the cost is equal between an autonomous vehicle that can take you to downtown for three dollars or a metro ride that can take you there for $1.75, is there is is LA ready for a network of dedicated lanes that could take you there just as fast in a bus? Oh, I think so for sure. And I think you know the great thing about LA is that, um, and, and a lot of other cities, is that the future will be what we call in the business multimodal. There will be many different kind of transportation choices, from bicycles, electric bikes, electric scooters that you may own or that you may call up unlock with your cell phone, uh, autonomous shared vans, uh, public transportation, etc. And of course, one of the fun things to consider if you go out maybe 15 years is uh, mobility in the third dimension, which is above our heads. And uh, Uber, for example, is spending literally uh, billions of dollars trying to figure out um, electric uh, vertical takeoff and landing taxis uh, that, uh, and, and they say they're going to start rolling out a commercial service in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is one of the two American cities where they're planning to do this in 2023. That's only four years, of, four or five years away. Yeah. <laughs> How do you think people respond to that? How do you think that the, the world around us will adjust and, and accept and embrace or reject and block that kind of vertical uh, inhabiting our airspace? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they say that they've, you know, one big issue is noise. And anyone who's been near a helicopter knows that the displacement of air can be a very noisy thing. 
they say they've really got that under control. They've seen some of the new technologies coming down the pike. So it's perhaps not quite as quiet as a silent electric car, but it's, it's really getting very quiet. So they've got the noise thing under control. Um, I think there'll be a question of visual pollution uh, when you have thousands of these circulating overhead. You know, do we really want that? Um, well, these are all electric. They, 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 yes, in fact, that's one of the great things that is, you know, it's one of the factors behind the mobility revolution is the, uh, the improvement in, in battery efficiency. So they're improving so much that they can really power a, uh, a, an air vehicle now. And so these are all electric. Yeah, they're all electric. Yeah. <laughs> For a place like Santa Monica, we um, not only have the vertical, but we actually have an entire coastline. Um, do you think Do you think Santa Monica should be looking at going out into the water? Is that something that, speaking sort of very locally, that has interest? Is, should Los Angeles be looking at water transportation more than it currently does? Uh, you know, I, I don't know enough about that. So um, many cities are. Uh, if you look at London, uh, in New York, for example, there's been a huge increase in the number of ferries uh, going across the river and up and down the river, etc. Uh, Paris as well. In fact, Paris is experimenting, will be experimenting later this year with autonomous uh, river ferries that will not have a driver. So uh, that's kind of interesting. It's a brave new world out there, I can tell you. <laughs> Um, what do you think about the um, potential labor impacts of a lot of this autonomy? Um, when you think about the job market and the large proportion of Americans that have driving jobs, how do you see that playing out over time and what industries might those people become trained to work in and or would they still be needed potentially? I mean, it's arguable potentially that an Amazon package can't take itself out of the back of the car even if the car can drive itself to your yeah. front door. So how do you, how are you Look, this is a very, very, very important and complicated issue because it's not only, if you look at autonomous driving, which takes the driver out of the car or the truck, um, this is true. There are uh, two million uh, trucking jobs in the United States. And you could think that you know, over the next decade, a lot of those will go because they will be automated. Um, I would say that, and the Teamsters Union, for example, which is you know represents a lot of truck drivers, uh, is very, very, very opposed to uh, the onset of autonomous vehicles. And in fact, you know, there's I think an upcoming round of negotiations with I think UPS, in which the Teamsters are demanding that UPS commit to never buying autonomous vehicles, never using autonomous vehicles. I don't think that's going to fly. The fact of the matter is the average age of a truck driver in the United States is 55. So it's, yes, so um, by the, and, and there are few young people going into that sector. It's not particularly attractive. There are other opportunities elsewhere. We're a nation of full employment. So I think that time will somehow solve some of these problems. The greater issue that we all must um, face as a society, and it's not only in the United States, of course, is just automation in general. Because it's not only uh, cars that are going to be automated, but it's so many other different kinds of transactions. And I think we, we face real societal choices about that kind of economy and society. But that's beyond my pay grade. <laughs> well, you, so you spent a fair amount of time with various companies in this sector yeah. and, and sort of tracking the very dynamic movements and investments that people are making. Um, can we talk a little bit about sort of why, you, what is motivating some of these companies? Um, so the city of Santa Monica is working on a permit system right now for um, shared mobility devices. Uh, you've seen Bird, you've seen Line Bike, you've seen Breeze Bike Share around. We're trying to figure out how to engage with private sector actors and uh, productively to provide mobility options for the community without, you know, and yet, yet avoid some of the, the uh, chaos on the streets. Um, 
one of the things that I've noticed in talking to a lot of these companies is that they come from very different motivations. There's a lot of different reasons people get in the business. It's not, it's not clear. It, it, they are certainly not cut all from the same cloth. Um, and I'm sure you're seeing a lot of the same thing. This has been interesting for me to, to learn in talking to all these people. When you think more broadly about Silicon Valley and Silicon Beach, um, what are you seeing as the motivating factors? How do you think this will shake out? Uh, and, and particularly thinking about sort of community interests in transportation, um, how do you see these companies interacting with sort of the public sector? Well, that's a good question, Francis. I mean, I think you have to just take apart that question. I think, I think for people working in the field, whether it's with a car, if you're in a car manufacturer, or you work at Bird, or you work at a, 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 an upstart in Silicon Valley developing autonomous vehicle technology, one thing I think they all or we all share is a feeling that this is going to be one of the most important revolutions of our lifetimes. Um, certainly comparable, if not greater, than the internet. And I think the general public still doesn't quite realize that. I think that's maybe a couple of years off, but I can tell you that's the case. So if you're a car manufacturer, you know, your whole business model is coming out the window. Um, internal combustion engines are finished, thank God. You know, they've almost ruined this planet. And they're, they're you know, they are going to be phased out. We are seeing massive electrification of every car company. But we also see that in the future, as autonomous vehicle technology and the possibilities get very real, that there will be probably a slow end to individual car ownership. So that is a huge challenge for General Motors or, or Chrysler or a, you know, a Renault or a Toyota. And so they're all trying to grapple with this. And if you see how they um, kind of present themselves to the world, Many of them are starting to say, well, we're not a car manufacturer, we're a mobility services company. And uh, GM, for example, is pretty much banging the house on um, electric shared vehicles that they will become essentially a taxi operator uh, in the future, as opposed to a supplier of, of you know, cars. So. <laughs> Um, some other thinkers also are starting to um, really see the synergies between um, retail sales as, and, uh, and this emerging transportation sector and, and thinking about the way in which some of our retail um, services will become completely mobilized. I mean, we all know food trucks very well. Um, it doesn't have to be limited to just a taco. Uh, what you can get out of something that's circulating around in your community. So I think that's that's interesting. Particularly Jeff Tumlin has been sort of positing these very sort of salacious things that could be happening in cars that are just sort of generally circulating around in our communities. Well, but you know, I think that's already happening, and I think you know that's a really good point you raise because um, if you look at food, you know, how do you eat food in the city? What do you do with food in the city? That's changing very rapidly. Um, right now, there are many, many services that they're on-demand food delivery services. I'm going to have a couple on my on my phone apps, and it's whether it's uh, Deliveroo, which is actually not in Los Angeles, but Uber Eats, uh, Postmates, um, various others. So you are sitting at home watching Netflix, and you know you most millennials don't know how to cook anyway. And you'll kind of order your meal, it'll arrive in 20 minutes at your doorstep. And that's more and more happening. The other part is food production. And we're finally looking in many cities around the world, including Los Angeles, at the rise of urban agriculture. So we produce in California much of the food that we eat here. But if you're in New York, you know, and you go to Whole Foods or Christie's in New York uh, in the winter, it's, or whenever, all of it shipped from the Central Valley of California. There's no reason why in New York we cannot produce all of the lettuce, all of, a lot of the food that we eat, the, the vegetables that we eat right in the city. Why do we need to truck it in from you know, 3,000 miles away? And that saves a lot of energy, it saves water. Uh, for example, the New Cities Foundation, which I'm, I'm very 
proud to lead, is headquartered in Montreal. Now, Montreal has really a horrible winter. Um, I don't know if you've ever been there in the winter, but it lasts for months and months and months, and it's 40 below zero, and you can't even stand it. Well, there's some great urban agriculture uh, uh, entities in Montreal. And what they do is they have these very high-tech greenhouses that are built above kind of low factories on the edge of Montreal. And the factory owners love giving up for free this real estate on their roof because it insulates them in the winter. So it's all free real estate. And these are amazingly high-tech, very, very efficient <coughs> greenhouses. And you have an app, if you live in Montreal, and you say, okay, what's, what's good today? Uh, you know, tomatoes, cucumbers, apples. You order it, like off three pounds of tomatoes, two pounds of cucumbers, so, uh, they get it in real time. They pick it, and you go the next morning and pick it up. So it's incredibly fresh, and it's incredibly good, by the way. It's I mean, the best vegetables I've ever had in my life. And it's in the, grown in the middle of the winter in the middle of Montreal. So that's the future, I hope. Well, that's a good. That's a very good point, sir. Look, in California, we you lose. We use a lot of renewable energy for our electricity. So when you add electricity, you're you're adding renewables. So it, it, it's it's a very positive thing. The issue is, you know, if you're in West Virginia and you use an electric car, the electricity coming off the grid to power an electric car comes from coal, and that's not good. Um, and I urge you all to write the president because he's a big pro coal guy. No, but I mean a little bit at the margin, but more and more and more is coming from wind and solar. And you know, thank you. I, uh, you know, maybe you know California. Yeah. I guess I'm kind of interested in knowing in your discussions with some of these companies how much they're invested in potentially either partnerships with some companies that could be developing more renewable sources because I think there could be some really uh, powerful business to business partnerships that could help sourcing more renewable electricity because I mean it's a good point that you know the electricity itself and the power itself as, as we move towards more electrified transportation is becoming more important and I wonder have you seen have you seen much in terms of those synergies, or is that still a new frontier? I think that's still a bit of a new frontier. I mean, some of the car makers are investing in electric vehicle charging outfits, but I mean, I'm sure they're talking to the utilities as well. I mean, the EV charging piece is an important one because, and EVs are electric vehicles, because uh, you need chargers, they have to be charged. And uh, the technology, also has to be improved a little bit. We have to make it very quick. You can't, um, and, and there aren't enough chargers. And I think a lady who has an EV, you know, uh, uh, if you live in a multi uh, uh, apartment building, uh, you know, you don't have your own garage. And so, how do you, know, what do you necessarily, what do you do? And um, so, there have to be a lot more EV chargers. It's very expensive. And so, I think. Um, you know, you know, the taxpayer will probably wind up paying some of them. So, um, as you can see in one of the slides, kind of that compares the sort of emissions profile of everything from, from walking to, to transit, um, we know that probably, it will probably not change that biking and walking remain the sort of fundamentally most uh, fuel efficient ways to get around. Uh, the bicycle is one of the most efficient devices we've ever designed. Um, what's the what's the relationship between some of the technology and these sort of tried and true methods, and and how you know what can people do to help keep themselves um, sort of comfortable and safe um, as these technologies are coming on the road? What, what what's the relationship there? Well, you know, I mean, we obviously need more bike paths. That's important. They're protected bike paths. I mean, there are far too many accidents already in the city involving bicyclists. Um, I think Santa Monica has had a very good um, 
policy regarding, for example, bird and electric scooters requiring helmets. I mean, nobody obeys that, unfortunately. But that's going to be the, the bird, of course, is a you know, local Santa Monica innovation that's now taking the nation by storm. Um, and there are a lot of bird-like, uh, what we call lightweight electric vehicles, LEVs. And I mean, they're absolutely exploding. And one of the interesting things about them is that the technology is, it's not like a car. I mean, you know, to produce a car, a new model, even today, it takes a year, year and a half, two years, it's planned, it's these very long life cycles. With these lightweight electric vehicles, like electric bikes or birds, the technology is ch literally changing every month or two. And um, it's, uh, there's a kind of, it, they're all made in China. The Chinese are just incredibly quick um, in, 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 in uh, coming out with new models, more and more efficiency, et cetera. And so, you know, that's a technology to watch, I think. Yeah. How about the technology of vehicle sensing of people on foot and on bicycle? How do you see that evolving? I think because that's something in our, particularly in Santa Monica, in our urban environment, it's very diverse. There's lots of different things moving in different directions all the time. Um, so I think the, the concern for autonomy, I think in our context, is really that it's sufficiently robust to sense people, yeah. even when they're unpredictable in behavior and location. Well, I, I gotta tell you, just based on what I saw the last few days up in Silicon Valley, I mean, the advances in the last few months are extraordinary. I mean, um, we were up at Mercedes-Benz Labs in Silicon Valley, where they're producing a full uh, autonomous vehicle. And they can sense, uh, you know, for example, if, if a plastic bag floats in front of an autonomous vehicle, you know, it looks like a bird or it could be a child, you know, it, but now they're really able to sense that up to the point where one of the big issues is, um, let's say you're, you know, uh, going down the street and there's a construction site. And so a construction worker in a hard hat comes out on the street and goes like this. And you know, just... Well now, autonomous vehicles can understand that, understand that human language. So it's the, 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 the rapidity of advancement in the technology is really extraordinary. So. I'm seeing some hands for questions, so why don't we start, I think Ken, you had your first. Yeah. Um, so congestion is Yeah, look, I mean, we don't live in Europe here, you know, we're in the United States, and Los, Los Angeles. Because if you take um, a Paris or a London, they've had um, a, you know brilliant in, uh, 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 
underground system of public transportation like we have in New York. Um, it's been there over 100 years, people are used to it. It's a very dense, dense, dense city, so you can, you know, a lot of people, everything is walkable. You know, it's out there within sort of half a mile. So we live in a different kind of, you know, uh, city here in LA, so it's going to take longer. There'll be, you know, every city is different. But have you modeled Well, I think it depends how they're used. If they're, if it's a shared solution, which I believe, I think they will solve a lot of the problem. And you'll probably take 65 to 70 percent of the vehicles off the road. By definition, that will. But when you say that, um, you know, only it's true that only uh, you know, typical cars only use five percent of the time. But the other part of the time, it's you know, clogging up streets with parking. Um, parking lots take up, you know, whatever, 17 to 20 percent of the land space in the city. So that's all land that over the next decade or two decades could be freed up for housing or for other uses. So it's, you know, it's a mixed picture. I mean, I think from my perspective, the, one of the critical things is the diversification of the expectation of mobility. Right now, we are still, we are still in a position where 90% of the time people expect to get into a car to get where they're going. The critical thing is that we, number one, start to realize there are other options and start to use them actively because the thing keeping a lot of people off uh, the road from walking and biking is that there's nobody else with them. The more we have people on the street, the safer everyone will be and feel. And it has a beneficial sort of uh, relationship to it. Just one second. Um, and I think that the other critical thing is that we need to start rebalancing our roads. We have built roads for the last 60 years for the vehicle at the expense of everyone else. And in San Monaco, we've done a great job of starting to dial that back, but I think we still don't do enough for seniors on bikes, seniors walking, kids getting to school. We still have a lot of areas where people are feeling threatened and actually are threatened when they're on the roadways. And I think it's a critical thing that we need to both do the land use work as well as the uh, roadway work, and then insist that our autonomous vehicles are shared, electrified, and connected. You've been patiently waiting. Thank you. Thank you. On that, is it legal for bird and skateboard riders to actually be riding, not walking their vehicles, their little, you know, wheeled vehicles? Riding down the sidewalk. Is that legal? Uh, California state law treats a skateboard like a pedestrian, so skateboards can be on the sidewalk, um, but a bird electric motor must be in the street. So in Santa Monica, you, the law is such that you must be in the street with that vehicle, and skateboards may be on the sidewalk. Thank you. But in practice, they rarely are. I mean, just today, you know, I do have a car, admit it, forgive me, Lord. But it'll be the last car I have, I think. But I was, you know, tur twice today I was turning into a parking lot and a bird was coming down the sidewalk and, you know, it almost crashed into me. And I think and, that's because you know, of this, the need for the space. You know, there needs to be space on the street where everyone can feel comfortable. And, and right now there's a limited space where even the bird folks can feel comfortable on the street. So, Is Jerry. there something being done to let people in Santa Monica know that it's illegal for a bird to ride the sidewalk? Uh, yes. Yes, there is work being done, both by the private and the public sector. Yep. Jerry. Yeah, I, I, I never had a car in my life. I was on a driver's license, and I kind of always have gotten around pretty good. I would buy a blue bus. Yeah. Walk Friends. In. Friends occasionally. That's right. I'm not a strange <laughs> person now, Jerry, that says the car is not Plenty of people riding safely on bikes on our streets. 
we've educated people that they have the right of way, and automobile drivers have to understand it. So I'm just glad Santa Monica does that, because I you know people are all excited. It's one of the best things that we do So let me let me just stop you there. So how do bullet trains fit in? Last this will be all our last question. We got to wrap up. I don't want to. I mean that's a charged issue here in California. I don't want to go there. Um, uh, I'd like to see it happen too. I mean I think you know efficient air travel takes you know is it's also a good way to get get around. So I think we have to weigh the you know cost and benefits of you know high speed trains versus air. And perhaps something like there, you know, there are new technologies coming down the pipe, like uh, Hyperloop, which is you know these vacuum tubes that Elon Musk has popularized. Um, I'm a bit skeptical myself, but you know that may be in a few years a much better solution to get from LA to San Francisco than in a very sort of heavy, you know, typical high-speed train. So, Okay, well, with that, I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you, John. We're glad to have you as a San Monica resident.